Hey, welcome back to Critical Thinking. In our last episode, we took a look at the very basics of scientific method. This time, we're going to be focusing in a little bit more on some experimental techniques that were developed by a British philosopher with the goal of trying to identify causes. Let's take a look. You should recall that experimental science is distinct from historical science in that it deals with observable present events. And experimentation is necessarily observable and present. So when it comes to the identification of causes, experimentation has proven incredibly useful and has advanced science further in the last 500 years than in all of the preceding millennia. But how exactly can we come to know the cause of some effect? The inductivist experimental method, which is the method of forming and testing hypotheses, seeks to discover causal connections. Through experimental testing, scientists try to determine what causes an effect and what does not. 19th century British ethicist, logician, and political philosopher John Stuart Mill contributed to advances in scientific methodology by outlining several inductive procedures that would enable researchers to hone in on probable causes of an effect and rule out non-causal factors. These came to be known as Mill's methods. And there are five. The method of agreement, the method of difference, joint method, method of concomitant variation, and the method of residues. Some of these methods include both positive and negative tests. Positive tests at best provide probable results. They try to determine what the cause is, but it's always possible that some unforeseen, unnoticed factor is the cause. The negative tests, on the other hand, provide virtually certain results. They indicate for sure what the cause is not, or at least attempt to do so. Let's take a look at some important concepts before we actually examine each method. Effect. This is anything that begins to be as the result of some cause. Notice how it's defined with reference to cause. We can just as easily define a cause as something that brings about an effect, but this seems uninformatively circular. So it might be better to think of a cause as that which produces and an effect as that which is produced. And yes, I'm going to ignore the fact that we can do the same for producer and product. Producer being what brings about a product and product being what is brought about by a producer. Nevertheless, even though they each have specific roles in this relationship, it's possible that something be both a cause and an effect, just not at the same time and in the same way. It's our law of non-contradiction. And that's because they are relative terms. Now, from the scientific point of view, an effect is the event that we're trying to understand or explain, the object of consideration, or the phenomenon that raised the initial problem or question. And then we have factors. An antecedent factor is some event or thing that precedes the event under consideration, something that happens prior. The importance of the antecedent factor is relative to the probability of it being causally related to the event which follows. An antecedent factor should not be confused with a cause. Rather, it's to be tested as a possible cause. A concomitant factor is something that happens at the same time as the cause, but is not the cause. It can easily be confused with the cause or mistaken for the cause, yet it may not even be necessary for the effect. And lastly, we have conditions. A necessary condition is one that must obtain in order for an effect to occur. So an event can occur without this type of condition. The sufficient condition is one that is adequate for an effect to occur, a condition that guarantees an event. These are very important terms, particularly when we get to propositional logic down the road. All right, our first method is the method of agreement, also called common thread reasoning. And there's both a positive and a negative version of this. Let's look at the positive version first. The positive method of agreement attempts to identify a sufficient condition. It tries to find out what the cause is. Stated, the single antecedent factor common to all situations where the effect occurs is probably the cause. There may be an unknown cause and the antecedent may only be incidental. If it can be demonstrated that there's only one possible factor present every time an effect occurs, there's a good chance that it is the cause, but it's only highly probable. Let's imagine we're doing chemistry. We'll run three experiments. We have our factors, say a number of different chemicals, and we have a phenomenon which occurs each time we mix the chemicals. We'll call this a reaction. 
In instance number one, we have factors A, B, and C, and the effect occurs. In instance two, we have D, C, F, the effect occurs. In instance three, we have F, G, C, and the effect occurs yet again. The single factor common to all instances where the effect occurs is obviously C, so it's probably the cause. The negative method of agreement tries to find out what the cause is not. The principle stated, no antecedent factor is the cause in whose absence the effect occurs. So the question is, does the effect still occur without this antecedent factor? If yes, that factor is certainly not the cause. In instance one, we have ABC and an effect. In instance two, we have ABC and an effect. In instance three, we have only B and C, but we still have the effect. The effect occurs here in the absence of A, so A can be eliminated as a causal factor. Mill's method of difference is also called relevant difference reasoning. And again, we have a positive and a negative version. The positive method of difference attempts to identify a necessary condition. The principle stated, in otherwise identical situations, the antecedent factor unique to one situation is probably the cause. If an instance where a phenomenon occurs and an instance where it does not have every element in common except one, this is probably the cause. This one antecedent factor is absent from the situation where the effect doesn't occur. The process is to keep isolating factors to see which one causes the effect. Here, let's run two experiments. The first, we have A, B, C, and D, and it produces an effect. In the second, we have B, C, and D, and the effect fails to occur. A is unique to instance one where the effect occurs, and the instances are otherwise identical. So A is likely the cause for the effect in question. Now, one way to remember the difference between method of agreement and difference is that agreement indicates that the effect occurs in each instance, or in other words, the results agree. And in difference, the effect differs between the instances. With the negative method of difference, the principle states that no antecedent factor can be the cause in whose presence the effect fails to occur. If it's really the cause, it would be able to produce the same effect repeatedly under the same circumstances. If the effect fails to occur in the presence of the supposed cause, then the supposed cause can't be the true cause. In instance one here, we have A, B, C, and D, and an effect. In instance two, we have A, E, F, and G, and no effect. We can rule out A as the cause since the effect fails to manifest in the presence of A in instance two. Now you might be thinking, well, what if A is the cause but only in combination with something like B? Haven't we ruled out A prematurely? Well, it seems like it. A in this case would be necessary but not sufficient. And if we were looking for the situation that produces an effect, A wouldn't be capable on its own. So the actual cause is more complex than A. But complex situations are why we shouldn't employ only one method on its own. And that's why we also have the joint method. And all I'm going to say about this third method is that it simply employs both the method of agreement and the method of difference. It's a strategy of cross-checking. And when the results from different methods point to the same conclusion, the probability of accuracy increases. The fourth method is the method of concomitant variation. And the principle states, if the occurrence of a phenomenon varies with a particular element, then that element probably is causally related to the phenomenon. Sometimes things happen in degrees. When one possible cause and effect vary together, you may have found the cause. The antecedent factor that varies proportionally to the effect may be the cause. Here we'll run five experiments and we'll play around with varying the amount of a select factor. In instance one, we get an effect. In instance two, we increase B, we get a greater effect. In instance three, we do it again. And as element B increases, the effect goes right along with it. Perhaps now we decide we're gonna decrease the quantity of B and observe the effect dwindle alongside. Yet again, we'll do the same thing. It looks like B might have some causal impact on our effect as the two are clearly related. Of course, correlation is not causation, and it's possible some other factor that's unknown might be at play. We could imagine a medical drug trial where a test subject with cancer was given several different experimental drugs. 
say drug B was increased and the patient showed signs of remission. Increase it again and the cancerous tissue begins to disappear faster. We could also imagine that the patient was allergic to drug B and it caused the patient's own body to produce a hormone that fought off cancer. But if there were no allergic reaction, there would be no benefit of the drug at all and in all other cases, nothing happens. Was the drug the cause of the remission or was the cause something else? Perhaps many other drugs would cause a similar reaction and yield the same benefits. Now, of course, this is just a thought experiment, but the point still holds. We have to be incredibly careful in our conclusions. And finally, method five, method of residues. It's also known as process of elimination. The principle states the antecedent factor that remains after the other antecedent factors are eliminated as probable causes is probably the cause. If you know what all the possible causes are and you can eliminate all but one, that one may be the cause. This is essentially the same as inference to the best explanation, which we've looked at before. That's a good place to wrap up our discussion of experimental methods. Next time, we're going to take a look at historical science, and we're probably going to introduce some mistakes in causal reasoning. So until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.